Get out. A couple of weeks ago, a friend and I were discussing the Best Picture nominees. Hey, Andrea. And she asked me what I thought should win. Not will win, but should win. And I said, depends what you mean by should. The movie I liked the most, Three Billboards. The movie I thought was the best piece of filmmaking as a whole, Phantom Thread. The movie that's the most of the moment of 2017? Because we all know that's at least part of it, right? Yes, Moonlight just so happened to also be the best movie of last year, but I'm not saying the election definitely pushed Academy voters away from the, hey, let's remember the fun parts of the 1950s movie and towards the sensitive movie about a marginalized person enduring a difficult world but I don't think it hurt. And the most of the moment movie of 2017 is clear. It's Get Out. And I know you may be thinking, oh, but what about, nope, it's Get Out. Oh, but the Me Too movement and a woman seeking justice for, stop it, it's Get Out. Jordan Peele began development on Get Out in the early years of the Obama administration, and he began production on Get Out in the later years of the Obama administration. And this is important to note because many people, short-sightedly, saw the election of America's first black president as the potential dawn of a post-racial America. And Jordan Peele wrote Get Out as a direct refutation of this notion of what he calls the post-racial lie. He wanted to say, yes, we have a black president, but let's not go patting ourselves on the back too much. So how incredible that in the time between beginning production on Get Out and actually releasing Get Out in theaters, we, in a large sense, proved him right. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know. Mom and dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> that there is in some ways the perfect encapsulation of the post-racial attitude that Jordan Peele was working against. Rose dismissing Chris's hesitation with, dude, it's fine, everything's cool now, all that's behind us. And it's worth noting that although Rose insists that her family doesn't care about race, we later learn that they very much do. Maybe not in the ways you're thinking or the ways Chris is thinking, but they do. Yes, this movie has secrets, but if you watch the trailer, what do you think is going on here? That, that right there, whatever it is you're thinking, that's probably it. Peel does a great job of slowly giving away little bits at a time, revealing pretty early on that something is off and then a little later confirming that something is really off, and then a little later revealing who's in on it, and then a little later revealing everything. And the secrets of the movie really hide in plain sight. The kind of thing where you watch it a second time and the signs are so obvious that you're shocked how you could have ever missed them the first time. And you should watch it a second time. Even setting aside the obvious clues of things to come, it's crazy how different some things play. Right. All I know is sometimes, but if there's too many white people, I get nervous, you know? do something. Once you know what's really going on, you get an entirely new appreciation for this piece of acting. It becomes so layered and nuanced that you wonder how Betty Gabriel didn't find her way to a Best Supporting Actress nomination. Speaking of which, how about this frickin' cast? I mean, if you just pitched me, hey, there's this movie written by either of these guys, starring Bradley Whitford, Katherine Keener, Allison Williams, the dude from that one episode of Black Mirror, Lakeith Stanfeld, Caleb Landry Jones, and Steven Goddamn Root. I'm watching that movie, even knowing nothing else. And I don't mean to gloss over Daniel Kaluuya. He's nominated for Best Actor here, and he damn well should be. His performance really carries the movie, in that he's basically in every scene, save for a few brief illuminating moments when we see what the other characters get up to and Chris isn't around, and it's appropriately understated. But really, the whole cast, brilliant as they've all been in the past, 
all bring their A game here. That's how this movie was selected by the Screen Actors Guild as one of the five best ensembles of the year. And a brief Oscar side note, that nomination, weirdly, really correlates with Best Picture winners. In the 23 year history of the award, Braveheart is the only Best Picture winner at the Oscars to not at least be nominated for Best Ensemble at the SAG Awards. And that was in the very first year the award existed. So they've been 22 for 22 ever since. And it's worth noting, two years ago when Spotlight upset The Revenant for Best Picture, take a look at the SAG Best Ensemble nominees that year. Last year when Moonlight seriously upset La La Land for Best Picture, Take a look at the SAG Best Ensemble nominees. In 2013, when people weren't sure if Best Picture would go to 12 Years a Slave or Gravity. In 2007, when people weren't sure if Best Picture would go to No Country for Old Men or There Will Be Blood. As of this writing, most people see Best Picture as a two-horse race between The Shape of Water and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Guess where my money is. And that's also incidentally why I think Get Out still has a chance. The performances are great, the directing's great, and Jordan Peele's just the fifth black person nominated for Best Director. But for me, the star of this show by far is the screenplay. Every Best Picture winner since The Artist six years ago also won a screenplay award. So given what I said earlier, the smart money for Best Original Screenplay this year would be either Three Billboards or Shape of Water. But seriously, the Get Out screenplay is maddeningly good. Most of the reasons why, I can't talk about, but let me give you a small non-spoiler example. The decision to make Chris a smoker. Not only does it add another layer of difficulty to an already difficult situation for our protagonist. He's outside his comfort zone in an unfamiliar place trying to impress his girlfriend's parents, and he has nicotine cravings to deal with on top of that. Not only does it cleverly solve a narrative problem by giving Rose's therapist mother a pretense for trying to hypnotize Chris, which we learn is a key plot point. Do you smoke in front of my daughter? I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. But when Rose's parents chastise Chris about his smoking, as expected, if I may use another example of something that plays out differently the second time you watch it, hot damn is their chastising loaded. I mean, every time I think about Jordan Peele making Chris a smoker, I just go down this rabbit hole of all these interesting things that that one choice gives you. For example, if I may speak vaguely to the people who've seen the movie, do you think Rose is dating Chris in spite of or because of his smoking. Small little flourishes like that are littered throughout, including giving Chris an interesting backstory with his mother that both adds theme and provides a reasonable explanation for some of the dumb things that people in horror movies always do. Peel even wrote a character that's a direct love letter to the black audiences that yell at the screen when people in horror movies do their dumb things. There's an element to this movie that uh, fulfills the representation that stereotypically black horror movie audience uh, needs out of their horror movie, which is like, you know, get out the house. Why are you still there? Call the cops. You know, I wanted to make a movie where that audience is satisfied. I can't talk about a lot of the smart choices or the implications of those smart choices, but as you're watching, keep a few things in mind. Race, obviously, but also like historical racism, uh, agency, and microaggressions. If you don't know what a microaggression is, then pay careful attention to literally every interaction Chris has at this party, save for one, because those are it. It's such a privilege to be able to experience another person's culture. And if you know what a microaggression is, but think it's a made up snowflake term, then you also watch every interaction that Chris has at this party and try to tell me with a straight face that these interactions aren't at least a little true. Whether it be the assumption that Chris would like Tiger Woods or an old lady feeling his bicep without asking, tacitly suggesting an ownership of sorts over his body. Jordan Peele said he wanted to get away from this idea that racism has to be this big, hyperbolic, hateful thing which is more often than not how it's portrayed in movies. Related side note, if you want some really good observations about how race and racism are portrayed in movies, check out Lindsay Ellis' video on Bright, worth every second of its, wow, 45 minute runtime. And I imagine Lindsay Ellis is a big fan of Get Out, not only opting for realistic microaggressions over outdated overt stuff, but also portraying racism as perpetrated not necessarily by individual bad people, but by societal systems and institutions. Can't really elaborate without giving away the game, but... Oh, there it is. 
Some uncomfortable but unavoidable truths about our country are woven into the very fabric of the narrative. Subtext, yes, but in a way that's inseparable from the text. Uncomfortable but unavoidable truths about the history of our country, largely built by black bodies owned by white people, but also truths about today in our country, where black bodies and black talent are valued, but maybe not necessarily black people. It's scary, but not too scary for a horrorphobe. It's funny enough to remind you it was written by one half of Key and Peele. And most importantly, it is scary smart. They treat us like family.